Hi there. In this lecture, we see Bobby Fischer against Paul Keres in the 1962 Curacao tournament round seven. So e4, e5. In this game, we see the d5 square being used as a springboard. And this was a theme mentioned in Netflix's Queen's Gambit, that major hit TV series. Uh, so we see the Royal of Pairs, which has black committing in this closed variation to a d5 hole. So pawns on the dark squares. And although a knight outpost is uh, under pressure, it can be used to energize the white position, the pieces. So after d4, knight d7, we see d takes, d takes, knight bd2, queen c7, knight f1, knight b6, and now the knight e3 root instead of knight f5, because the bishop covers f5 anyway, but the knight e3 root offers this amazing idea of trying to liberate all of these pieces, like the bishop, the rook. Uh, if this pawn can be got rid of, it would enable the white pieces to spring into life, to liberate them. We see rook d8, queen e2, and after bishop e6, this is a bit of an inaccuracy. Black should uh, consider f6, so that if knight d5, this position, if rook takes, there's things like bishop e4, but say this, it's better for white, this scenario, anyway. But black actually makes things worse with this bishop e6 move. And now knight d5 is a really, really powerful move. If the queen moves, you know, it's, it's liable to drop e5 at some point. The, the queen's holding e5. So we have knight takes d5, e takes. And we can see that uh, this bishop's being liberated. The pressure on the e pawn. So it opens up white's pieces considerably. This is a very interesting position for white. All of the pieces are on full blast. There are concrete threats emerging, maybe queen h5 at some point as well. And even this rook with a4, that's not entirely bad. There's always an a4 to liberate that rook. So all of the pieces are very active. We see rook a7, awkward looking, bishop f4, Queen b6, now rook ad1. So look at this centralization. So this rook is participating as well. g6, and now with this huge central control and pieces at full power, Fisher can probe into these dark square weaknesses. I mean, the move g6 was prompted because there are issues like queen h5, which are worrying. Uh, so g6 weakening the dark squares. Now knight g4 starts to create concrete threats in the position like queen e5 and knight h6 check. You can imagine the queen crashing down to h8 mating. So we have knight c4 controlling e5. Also, I mean, the tactics are also kind of interesting. If bishop f6, can you see what white could play here? If I give you five seconds, there's a crushing combination here. If you put your tactical hat on here, what would you, what would you play? Okay. Check all the forcing moves. Queen e8 check takes rook takes, and now there's bishop h6 checkmate. So black has to be super careful. So knight c4 was played, and here we see bishop h6, bishop e6. Perhaps you can argue this next move is a slight inaccuracy from Fisher bishop b3. The bishop okay is blunted at the moment, but b3 is actually it's got quite a lot going for it. If b3 was played instead, we can actually work on both sides of the board with b4. Because sometimes there's a skewer line, you know, this is a bad configuration in a way to expose a theoretical skewer downside with bishop e3. Uh, so, for example, if c takes b4, queen e5 first, and now bishop e3, and it's not even about the skewer actually, there's something even more important here, white's play here, which has just been introduced by bishop e3 vacating h6. We can actually hope you can guess white to play here. What would you play? Okay, you can actually play knight h6 check here and queen h8 checkmate. So there's a lot of fun actually from b3. If we just look at this again. If rook c7, queen e5, I and mean, this is mega dangerous. Rook takes, for example, and bishop e3. There's a lot of painful pressure on, on the queen side here. So this, this would be very, very nice. 
potentially picking up material like this. So anyway, b3 may be a slight improvement to Fisher's play, but bishop b3 was played, queen b8. This makes things a lot worse for Paul Carroll's this queen retreat. His best was probably bishop takes g4, but even so, white's got a, a big advantage here. It seems that earlier knight d5 really energized the white position with full effect. So queen b8, we have rook takes d8 check, bishop takes d8. If queen takes d8, we can actually play bishop takes c4. If bishop takes, can you see what white plays here? If I give you five seconds, pause the video here. Okay, there's knight f6 check. There's back row issues cropping up. If bishop takes, there's a back row issue. Chat mate. Otherwise, if king h8, there's queen e5. And if here, you know, this is just nasty. After b3, knight d7 check, queen b8 check, that loose rook could be picked up. So lots of uh, tactical opportunities for sure. Bishop takes d8 was played. We have bishop takes c4, bishop... And uh, now b takes c4. Otherwise, there's a back row mate again with queen e8. So double pawns. And in fact, guess what Fisher plays here, given the back row issue. Okay, queen takes c4. Yeah, trying to get the bishop out of the way for rookie 8 chat mate. It's, uh, it looks an absolutely devastating position. We have queen d6. Queen a4, threatening queen e8. We have queen e7. Here, if rook d7 had been played, then knight e5 is strong with bishop g5 in mind. And for example, yeah, just c coming through like this, winning material. So queen e7. And now, again, this, this is such an amazing game tactically in a way. What, is, what does white play here? Fisher plays an amazing tactical move in this position which improves things. He plays knight f6. The queen can't take because of queen e8, checkmate. The knight pivots around to d5. And now the queen comes to the center, joining forces. So if bishop takes, queen e8 is mating with a back row mate ensuing. Uh, so here we have queen d6 being played. As another example of a5, then check and mate or if f6 then queen takes e6 wins a piece yeah you know queen takes just to show the back row again though queen takes and then rookie a is back row mating or bishop takes we've got the back row mating like this so anyway so queen d6 was played and now knight f4 This is interesting. Again, in this position, uh, maybe, you know, B3 is interesting as well, like this. Uh, you know, it turns out move like B4 is super strong because check and picking up the rook. You know, there's a loose rook liability here. But this is this is strong for other reasons as well, this idea. If rook D7 taking and then check, uh, you know, crashing through. Yeah, it puts pressure on the queen side. This B3, uh, C4 and B4 idea it's crushing stuff but knight f4 is strong as well now rook e7 then, and there is a tactical shot here which fisher didn't see i mean he plays a move which he thinks is winning anyway one assumes he calculates as though it's good enough but there is a tactical shot you can see that there's a skewer in theory theoretical downsides become sort of actual downsides sometimes so can you, can you see what white could have done here Sometimes we have to look inside the opponent's position without any regard for our own moves. Just wait, see what are the theoretical issues that you can observe. Then look at the moves that you can use to play with that fact. And here, you know, we could play bishop f8. <laughs> Fisher misses this. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> we could play this just to win the exchange. Fisher's move is strong though, bishop g5. To be fair, it's very strong. It goes into a winning end game anyway. This is a winning end game position. And the game doesn't last that long. In fact, Paul Carres resigned here. He trusted Fisher's end game technique from this from this point. He resigned at move forty.
Now, if it continued, and Fisher's move, by the way, rook b7 is a lot more practical than computer moves, which seem to not involve restricting the opponent's king. A rook on the seventh like this is learnt from, you know, Capablanca. You restrict the opponent's king as a priority. You don't want the opponent's king coming out. So it just makes the position a whole load easier to play if you know that you can basically improve your king quality and the opponent's king stranded on the back row. So that's a great key move rather than anything else as a prelude. So we have this position and, and black resign. But if it continues, you know, king g3, we can improve our king. And the computer does let, let the opponent and the kings out just to try and win a pawn, actually, on this occasion. If we're following the computer recommendations, okay. All right. We'll pop out for a bite to eat. But, yeah, anyway. Paul Carras was convinced Fisher would grind them down from here and just resigned. Yeah. So, anyway, one of the uh, main takeaways, this is one of the more vivid demonstrations. So, in my view, of this knight d5 springboard against the Royal Lopez structure, which does create, it seems in theory, an Achilles heel on d5. So the springboard effect of maneuvering to, you know, e3, and then you can see the, the pieces on full pelt here after the knight takes e5. This is a beautiful position where black doesn't seem actually that solid. This knight's over here, away from the king. It seems as though there are so many tactical opportunities. The king's slightly loose. And those dark squares are just delicious, in my view, to try and tap into now after g6. A lot of delicious tactical opportunities start arising. The positions, you know, Fisher's getting, he, he did say sometimes, you know, tactics flow from superior positions. But they also flow from bad uh, theoretical issues within the opponent's position as well. It's not just your strength of your positions, the weaknesses within the opponent's position tactics flow. But yeah, he, his positional play is so brilliant that even if he's inaccurate later, he can still win. But yeah, we can nitpick. But, you know, he got those fantastic positions to start off with. So if we want to improve, we should pay attention to the positional play of Fisher, not just the tactics. And he get, gets this amazing position through this manoeuvre to d5. The position, you know, liberates, this manoeuvre liberates all of the white pieces. And it provokes, starts provoking weaknesses because of the uh, threats like queen h5. And these weaknesses create more tactical opportunities. Okay. Thanks so much. Hi guys. If you enjoyed this video lecture, you might want to get more at my course, Kings Crusher TV slash Bobby Fisher, which I had a blast creating over 25 hours of video content. I tried to get the most instructive juice out of every single game covered and picking the most important games from this period. I had an absolute blast creating it and I think you will have an absolute blast checking it out. And it's at a big discount code with this link. You know, Kings Crusher TV slash Bobby Fisher has the discount code. So I hope you do check that out. Thanks very much.